Okay, so this question says uh, 2,000, some mass kilogram <laughs> railway uh, freight car costs at some initial speed, let me say V1, underneath a grain terminal, which dumps a grain directly down into the freight car. Okay, so let me just to make sure I understand. Um, there's a car that's moving with some speed uh let me label this m1 actually because i feel like there might be another mess oh uh, yeah there's another mess so as it's moving there's a, some kind of a grain terminal or something that's uh, dropping basically another mess m2 or m grain that's being dropped down so we could say this has initial speed of zero if the speed of the loaded freight car must not go below this speed, okay, let me call this V final. Uh, what is the maximum mass of grain that it can accept? Okay, yeah. So the picture we have is after uh, grain has been dumped onto the cart that's uh, moving below. And then now we have this combined mass of the thing, which is going to be M1 plus M2. And it, uh, let's just put in the condition that they're asking for. We'll say it's a moving as speed of a final. And the, um, and the, the give, we are going to plug in the minimum speed that they want, and that'll give you us the maximum mass. If they somehow drop a mass of grain that's lower than that, then they, uh, the free, free final will be simply larger than what we calculate. So, this is the kind of interaction that you can analyze as a completely inelastic collision. And there are two things to watch out for when you're dealing with a completely inelastic collision. Uh, I guess uh, in terms of identifying it first, um, really the, which is not one of the two things, <laughs> identifying completely inelastic collision, you are looking for some kind of sticking condition. Uh, something that forces whatever objects are colliding to move together after the collision. That's what identifies completely inelastic collision. So in terms of the two things to watch out for, the first thing is that it's inelastic. So you can't say uh, energy is conserved, or more specifically, you can't say uh, kin so kinetic energy is not conserved. That's what inelastic means. And there are other inelastic collisions that you will see or have seen. Um, and you will usually see that in a lot of inelastic collision questions, they give you additional pieces of information because not being able to use conservation of kinetic energy means you need those additional information. Uh, this is where, so this is point one, don't use conservation of energy when you see completely inelastic collision. And number two, it comes from the sticking part. Because it's a, it's a sticking collision, it's the kind of collision where two things move together, you actually uh, know an additional piece of information, which is a V final is common to both objects. And this is actually what allows question writers to not, um, not give any additional piece of information. Because being able to say, so here basically what it means is V1 final, and V2 final are equal to each other, and the combined expression, we just call them together V final. So this equation means that you actually have enough information to solve through the question without the question writer giving you additional pieces of information that they might have uh, given you normally. So we approach this question like almost all the questions that we'll first uh, approach um, um, tackling. Um, from this point on, well, from last week and on, we are going to see if a conservation law strategy will work. Conservation law strategy is the, really the strategy that you should attempt to first, unless you know how you should exactly solve it, because it's the easier, easiest strategy to try out, see if it'll work, and if it doesn't work, rule it out, and then just uh, move on to a different strategy. And the first step, uh, where you will try to figure out will this work is you identify conserved quantity. And here, I've already said kinetic energy is not conserved. And here it doesn't feel like uh, it'll involve any potential energy. So it must, 
through process of elimination, the only quantity that's conserved here must be momentum. So we will uh, write down conservation law equation using momentum and go from there. So step, by the way, these are really, um, this is, I'm writing down the steps one and two, but I don't really teach them as rigid set of steps, the way I do with the standard strategy, because it's a, uh, uh, at some point I do want you to kind of develop your own approach uh, that, um, that works for you. I, these are the number of steps that works for me. Maybe you want to break this down further or combine some of them. It's up to you. you know. Each person, engineer, scientist does it differently. Step number two, once you've identified the conserved uh, quantity, then you write down conservation law equation. And as you are doing that, you really need to identify useful snapshots. In some questions, it's basically given for you. Here, uh, in collision questions especially, uh, here you have um, this pre-collision state, like here. This pre-collision state would be my snapshot A that's going to be useful for me. And then I have this post-collision state that's going to be my snapshot B that will be useful for me. And uh, what conservation means is that conserved quantity doesn't change between the snapshots. So the conservation equation I write down will be uh, the total sum of the quantities, total sum of, sum of momentum in snapshot A. Let me write that down. So total momentum in snapshot A is equal to the total sum of all the quantities in snapshot B. They are equal because momentum is conserved, I think, and doesn't change. And if you need uh, conditions to check is momentum conserved, uh, you go through the conditions that's described in the lecture. Uh, for momentum, really, what it comes down to is net impulse due to external forces is equal to zero. So after having written down this equation, I just, uh, um, for step number three, I'll just say, et cetera. Uh, there. It's kind of, once you've written down the equation you are starting with, then uh, the next few steps should follow naturally. So you are trying to write down the total momentum, okay? So you go into, all right, what are my uh, components, consist, constituents for the momentum? I have momentum of the car, so let me write down M1, V1 from definition of momentum. And I do have momentum of the grain, which because of its zero velocity, it'll be zero, but let's write it down anyway. Um, so it's gonna end up being zero, that's fine. And at, in snapshot B, I have the total momentum. Let's write the combined masses as one. Since they move together, I can kind of treat them as combined mass times uh, V final. So, okay, so in this question, let's see. Uh, I have, uh, that's the only equation. I have one equation. Let's see, I know M1 that was given. I know V1 that was given. I said this is zero. And I know V final, I'm gonna set it at the maximum or minimum value they could accept. Uh, so M2 is my only unknown and I think it's uh, uh, solvable. So from here, you do algebra. Um, let me just, uh, for the purpose of, because I thought, I think, uh, I've done um, algebra by hand on, on enough of these questions. Let me demonstrate use of a computer algebra system yet again. <laughs> and, and so if you don't have a Sage Math set up on your computer like how I have it set up, you can always use Sage Math cell. And um, a lot of the commands that I you see me running on my own instance of uh, Sage Math, it will also work here. So, uh, except, you know, here it doesn't, uh, you have to enter it all at once. You can't do it interactively the way I'm doing here. That's why I'm doing it here. Let me declare the variables I'm using. I need M1, M2, uh, V1. I, I don't think I'm going to use V2, uh, V final. Okay. So those are my variables. Let me uh, define my equation, which is M1 times V1 plus 0 is equal to M1 plus M2 times V final. It, it's an easy equation and, you know, solving it, it's easy algebra. I'm just uh, purposefully being lazy. <laughs> so let me take this equation and have the system solve this equation for M2, with uh, mass of the grain, which is what we want. 
So after it's done solving, okay, that looks reasonable. Yeah, I think I'm gonna get a positive answer. Um, yeah, so let me put this uh, into my solution. I'm going to take the previous output and take the first element of it, which will be my um, solution. Uh, so to, for the number that I will plug in into the uh, plug into the system to check, let me just uh, um, type in the numbers I'm given. So I'm using the substitution syntax. Uh, say m1 is uh, 20, 30 kilogram, v1 is 4.1 meter per second, and I'm reviewing the units and making sure they are in basic SI units. If not, I need to make uh, some argument to how if I need to do any conversions and whatnot. Uh, v final is 2.8 meter per second, also in basic SI unit. All right, that all looks good. So when I plug that in, I get M2, the maximum acceptable mass is 942.5 kilograms. Okay, so 943 rounding. Good, that's it. Um, <laughs> not that hard. <laughs> um, uh, here, I'll just say uh, computer algebra system. The thing is, so I do want you to practice algebra and get better al algebra. There are certain kind of simplifications that computer algebra systems don't do well, and that's where having um, developed your algebra muscle will help you. But at the same time, I don't want algebra to be an obstacle for you in this class. You're going to have plenty of chance in your career as an engineer and scientist to develop your algebra skill. So in this uh, you know, first semester of engineering physics, if uh, you need to use computer algebra system to kind of get a little bit of help, that's perfectly fine. I encourage you to use it.